Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Fire. Now, uh, let us assume that the source is not an ideal source, you have some source resistance. So, in general, it may be driven by some other amplifier stage, right? So, uh, it may be coming from some other common source amplifier or differential amplifier, and we know that output port of such amplifier, you may represent it as, say, uh, 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 output, source, output port of an amplifier, any other amplifier, you can represent it as a uh, current source and the corresponding RO, which is going to the next stage. I can also represent it as uh, equivalent voltage source VO and RS. So, in general, when one of the amplifier is being driven by the previous stage, suppose this is going to the next stage amplifier that we are right now considering, this is my active common active load common source amplifier, this is my common source amplifier and it is getting signals from the previous stage. So, I can model that previous stage as it says equivalent Thevenin model where the output signal is in series with the RS, the uh, source resistance, effective source resistance of the previous stage. So, I can represent, uh, you have the DC bias, again we are not going to detail how you are uh, getting this DC bias, suppose you, somehow you are able to bias the gate voltage and then on the top of that you have the um, signal swing, the AC signal with source resistance. So, you are having the R signal over here which is capturing this source resistance. Now, in this case, how do we find out the frequency response, high frequency response? For that, we have seen yesterday, the shortcut to do this is to find out the RC time constants at the circuit nodes. So, in this circuit, we have already seen that this VGP is a constant, this is a DC value ideally. So, I can uh, comfortably treat this as an AC ground. So, AC point of view, AC equivalent circuit if I want to draw, the VGP is at AC ground, the source of the M1, M2 is also at AC ground because connected to VDD. I am setting the capital VG to 0 for AC analysis. So, you are having R signal and you are having VG source is AC ground. This is the AC equivalent circuit at low frequency. Now, if I want to go for higher frequency and capture the effect of the parasitic capacitances, once again I need to draw the various capacitances contributed by M1 and M2. Now, consider that the substrate of M1 is grounded. We have seen that for NMOS the substrate sub should be at the lowest potential ground in the IC and likewise for the PMOS the substrate should be at the highest potential that is also VDD, so that is also ground. So, that eliminates one of our capacitances between the body and the source. So, the C S B is eliminated because of this uh, AC ground. You, you may have DC potential between the body and the source, but both of them are constant, they are fixed to DC potentials and as a result both of them are AC ground. So, there is no AC potential, there is no change in this potential across V uh, S and V B as a result the small signal VSB is 0 and I do not need to care about the effective small signal capacitance between VS and VB. What I need to take care of others which is CGD1, now CGS1 is appearing between gate and the source which is once again AC ground and finally, we have the CDB1 appearing between drain and body which is once again AC ground. So, this is also appearing effectively between drain and body, body uh, AC ground. Likewise, for M2 once again you have the CGD2 between the drain and the AC ground and likewise at this node I have the CD B2 between the drain and the body terminal of M2, which is again an AC ground, right. So, if I further want to simplify this complicated looking high frequency 
model, I can redraw this circuit a little bit uh, with simplified capacitance. So, if I look at the C G D 2 at this node that is appearing between the drain and AC ground also C D B 2 is appearing between drain and AC ground. So, basically we have an effective capacitance at this node between you know C G D 2 plus C D B 2. Likewise, I have the C D B 1 appearing between this node and AC ground. So, what we can say is C G D 2 plus C D B 2 plus C D B 1 is the effective small signal capacitance between this node and AC ground. So, I can write this as total combined value C G D 2 plus C D B 2 plus C D B 1. On the input side, uh, we have C G S 1 between the gate and the AC ground. So, this is C G S 1 and then we also have C G D 1 which is appearing between the gate and the drain. So, we have this C G D 1 between the gate and the drain and then we have the R S R signal and the signal source. <coughs> now, we have seen yesterday how to tackle small signal capacitance appearing between two nodes. We want to reduce the circuit to a simplified you know uh, equivalent AC model where we are having small signal capacitances appearing between the unknown node voltages and AC ground. We do not want small signal capacitances between two unknown node voltages. So, here once again I can apply Miller law on C G D 1 and further simplify the circuit. So, at the output finally, if I break this C G D 1 into an equivalent capacitor, I get remember 1 plus A with 1 plus mod A. So, this is going to be 1 plus in this case G M R O by 2 or basically more accurately R O 1 parallel R O 2 times C G D 1 coming into picture and plus all the previous term which is C G D 2 plus C D B 2 plus C D B 1 sorry uh, I am just sorry this is this is I have just written the opposite thing. So, here it is 1 upon whereas, on the opposite side on the source terminal we have uh, C G S 1 and here we get the 1 plus a on the other side we get 1 uh, plus 1 upon mod a here we have the equivalent capacitance coming as 1 plus g m 1 R O 1 parallel R O 2 times C D C G D 1 and this is my equivalent capacitance at this particular node. So, what I have done is I have found out the small signal capacitance between my two nodes and AC ground. And now the remaining task is to find out the small signal resistance between the two nodes and AC ground that is going to give me the R C time constant at the two nodes at the first node and the second node and that is going to give me the two poles. So, remember what we did in the last class was we have the low frequency gain of the amplifier which is minus g m r o 1 parallel r o 2 this is multiplied by the two factors the two poles because in this circuit node in this circuit we have two nodes. So, this gets multiplied by 1 plus s upon p 1 and 1 plus s upon p 2 where p 1 and p 2 are 1 upon r equivalent 1 times c equivalent 1. So, we have found out c equivalent 1 what is the equivalent small signal capacitance between the node 1 and AC ground. Likewise, we have to find out r equivalent 1. So, what is the r equivalent 1 between this node and AC ground looking into the gate MOSFET has infinite impedance ideally. So, infinite small signal resistance looking into the gate on the other side we have small signal resistance equal to r signal that is between the gate and the AC ground that is r signal. So, I can just say this is going to be r signal. What about P 2? What is 1 upon r equivalent 2? 
So, c equivalent to we have already found out. So, this is the expression for c equivalent to which is given and I also need to find out what is the r equivalent to. So, once again if I go back to my small signal model and I try to see what is the small signal resistance between the drain node that is this output node and the AC ground that is once again just going to be parallel combination of R O 1 and R O 2. So, R equivalent to that is a small signal resistance between drain and AC ground that is just R O 1 parallel R O 2. So, here we write R equivalent to R O 1 parallel R O 2. So, this gives me the value of the two poles we are looking at. Now, depending upon the circuit one of these poles can be higher another one can be lower. So, for example, if this previous source ha previous stage happens to be a common source amplifier or a differential amplifier with resistive load where the load resistance is pretty small maybe 1 kilo ohm 2 kilo ohm. So, in that case despite this capacitor being large despite having a large multiplication for this CGD 1 here and resulting in effectively large CG let me call this CG total value CG and let me call this total value CD. So, despite having this large multiplication Miller multiplication if I having R signal small so suppose the output impedance of the previous stage is small this can still be you know higher. But in general if it is being driven by a similar stage with this kind of active load the previous stage is also having similar output resistance R O 1 parallel R O 2 and here you are having large Miller multiplication as a result this can be the dominant pole because this can be the lower frequency as compared to P 2 where the total capacitance is relatively small. So, if I assume that the R equivalent at these two nodes are similar in that case this node is going to give us dominant pole because of this Miller multiplication factor. So, once again this is going to be the uh, frequency limiting or bandwidth limiting node because if this is a uh, high impedance source R signal is high coming from a previous stage which is having relatively large output resistance we are going to have R C time constant over here large because of its Miller, Miller multiplication factor and as a result this node determines my 3 dB cutoff frequency this is the lower of the two poles. So, we will uh, cover you know how to uh, get the board plot and do the stability analysis for multipole that we have not covered yesterday we just looked into the 3 dB cutoff frequency for a single pole system and we looked at the 20 dB cut roll off that happens after the first pole. But in case of multiple poles once again you have 20 dB and after the second pole you have 40 dB per decade slope those, those things we will be covering tomorrow when we um, get to the stability analysis of our feedback uh, amplifier for the front end. Now, this is about the frequency response and as we did last time we are now uh, going to look at the noise analysis. So, whatever we are doing here it is going to be directly applicable in the design of our differential amplifiers or the two stage amplifiers op amps. So, this is uh, we will not repeat all these analysis we will just remind you that this is the thing we have already covered and we will uh, use the result that we have obtained over here. So, now let us look at the noise analysis. So, now I can once again redraw my circuit now I am not drawing the reference branch remember. So, in our previous analysis we have seen that the reference branch is constant DC voltage this is AC ground. So, I am not drawing the reference branch this is the reference branch of the current mirror I am just ignoring this because this is the DC potential ideally. So, let us uh, just draw the two transistors the load transistor and the input device and now we are trying to see the effect of the noise sources in these two uh, transistor. What we have seen yesterday the noise sources you have the channel current noise call this m 1 call this m 2 this is 4 k t gamma g m 1 now gamma can also be different definitely. So, we can call it gamma 1 gm 1 does not matter this is a constant quantity and likewise you have the channel current noise for m 2 again 4 k t gamma gm 2 and likewise you have the noise voltages 1 upon f noise uh, sources k upon f c o x w l w 1 l 1 again k can be different k 1 k 2 we can write this as k 1 k 2, uh, but does not matter in the analysis. 
we are just looking at the parameter on which we have control that is the w by l ratios and the gm and then once again here you have um, k upon f cox w2 l2 now we have seen that if the source is at ac ground i can reflect this small signal noise source at the gate into an equivalent drain current so i can uh, capture the effect of this noise voltage at the gate in form of a uh, drain current by multiplying this voltage by gm square because remember this is the uh, mean square values of the spectral density so i can just multiply this by gm square and reflect it as a uh, current so if i take it in the form of a current source and i add this in parallel with the noise current produced by the channel i can add the term k upon f cox w2 l2 times gm2 square likewise if i try to reflect this in the form of another parallel current source i can add the term k upon f cox w1 l1 times gm1 square so in that case i have just four uh, current sources with mean square values given by these expressions and now if i look at the small signal even without drawing the small signal i can find out what is the small signal voltage because if these are the total small signal currents flowing between drain and source in the ac analysis what are we going to get at this node we're going to have the small signal resistance of these two mosfets m2 and m1 coming in parallel just like we did in the previous case so since we have reflected these noise voltages on the drain side in form of current so now these two become ac ground so at the input side m1 i can just put an ac ground over here and here i have captured the total noise current because of m1 by multiplying the input source by gm square and likewise so i can call it in1 square and likewise i have also captured in2 square and we know from drain to source we are going to have the ro of m1 between drain and ac ground likewise we are going to have ro of m2 that is ro2 between drain and once again ac ground which is vdd so once again you have ro1 parallel ro2 and if you have to multiply and get the voltage remember this is i in 1 square i in 2 square we want to get the vo n square over here so we to multiply this by ro1 parallel ro2 square so i can just write down the total current equation uh, total equations for the vo n square which is just going to be ro1 parallel ro2 square multiplied by i in 1 square plus i in 2 square now if i just expand this now once again uh, another concept that we have seen yesterday is the concept of input referred noise where we want to compare the overall noise produced by the circuit with the input signal appearing at the gate so if we can reflect this total vo n square to the input port then we can compare this total noise produced by the circuit with the input signal so that is the standard way of quantifying the noise in the circuit we can get the magnitude of input referred noise and to do that we need to multiply this vo n square by the gain of this circuit so what is the small signal gain of this circuit from the gate to the drain that is just gm square times ro1 parallel ro2 square so av square if i look at the magnitude of the gain square that is just gm1 square ro1 parallel ro2 square therefore i need to divide this entire equation by gm1 square ro1 parallel ro2 square therefore this ro1 parallel ro2 square anyway goes away i am just left with 1 upon gm1 square so 
I have to basically divide this entire equation by gm 1 square. Let me do that 4 k t gamma gm 2 upon gm 1 square plus 4 k t gamma upon gm 1 plus k gm 2 square upon gm 1 square f c o x w 2 l 2 plus k upon f c o x w 1 l 1. Now, if I go further and try to look at the device parameters like how g m 1 and g m 2 are dependent upon the sizes of the transistors and try to figure out from there how uh, uh, the overall input referred noise of this circuit can be minimized. What are the design parameters that is basically w by l and g m once again g m depends upon i d. So, that as designers we have these options in hand we have the gm1 gm2 in hand we have the w and l in hand so we need to make appropriate choices for this parameter so that this term can be minimized so to do that we need to convert these gm1 gm2 into the uh, parameters on which it depends which are basically w l of the devices and the id so what is gm2 equal to so gm2 if i write down gm2 square w by l 2 times i d w by l mu p c o x or I can call it w 2 l 2 w 2 by l 2 i d mu p c o x and what is g m 1 equal to 2 times w by l 1 times i d mu n c o x. So, c o x goes away we have i d going away if I assume mu n and mu p are close, we can, we can get rid of those as well, which are because they are not really in our hand. So, we are more interested in looking at the dependency on the parameters which are in our hand. We see that w 2 also goes away in this term, w 2 also goes away. We are going to get l 2 square in the denominator, so l 2 over here, l 2 over here, l 2 square in the denominator and w by l 1 in the denominator. This is the story of this term, which is relatively the most complicated term other terms is simple to see this is just g m 1. So, basically we are going to get root under w by l 1 i d 1 and likewise g m 2 upon g m 1 square once again over here. So, once again w by l 1 over here. So, if I further simplify this. So, I can write down 4 k t gamma. Now, these two quantities i d gets cancelled and therefore, you are left with uh, c o x mu suppose I assume they are constant we are just left with w by l 2 and here uh, so, uh, sorry it does not get cancelled you have suppose mu n c o x and i d goes to the denominator uh, we have g m 1 square as 2 i d w by l. So, you have w by l 1 uh, and you are having root under i d coming over here and you have the c o x and the mu p coming over here. This is the first term. Second is 4 k t gamma upon g m. I do not need to simplify this because g m 1 I know uh, dependencies on w by l and i d. This term uh, once again I have k times um, w upon l. Let me use a separate uh, w by l 1 times l 2 square this is what I am getting in the denominator and likewise this last term is k upon f c o x w 1 l 1. So, let me write it a little more clearly so that. So, let me just copy this and then from there try to conclude what is going to happen to the overall uh, noise expression. So, here once again 4 k t gamma w upon l 2 mu n c o x upon root under i d w upon l 1 2 c o x times mu p plus 4 k t gamma upon g m 1 plus k upon 2 w by l 1 l 2 square plus k upon f c o x w 1 l 1. 
So, uh, and of course, in the first term also you have the f term, the frequency dependent term. So, these two are the frequency dependent term 1 upon f and these two are the white noise term. So, yesterday we have talked about the concept of corner frequency where the white noise term and the 1 upon f term meet. So, if I call, say this is your v i n or uh, v i n square which is the mean square of input referred noise per hertz and this is the frequency. This is the corner frequency at which the 1 upon f term over here becomes equal to the uh, white noise term. This is independent of frequency. This is this level constant level is going to be proportional to the first two term. right? So, if I say this term is going to depend upon the first two term. Now, if I say uh, what is the dependency on these device parameters of w by l 1 and 2. So, here if I look about look at the 1 upon f terms we see that it is advantageous to go for larger w and l for the input device. So, input device if I am making the w and l large I can possibly get a, a larger a smaller 1 upon f noise. But if I make l 1 large then you see here the L 1 is going to come into denominator. So, making L 1 large may not be a very good option. I can make rather W 1 large. So, to minimize this term as well as this term I can rely on making W 1 large because if I make L 1 large second term is going probably going to make problem create problem L 1 will be coming in the numerator. L 2 square is coming over here. L 2 is also coming as 1 upon root L 2 in the first term. So, definitely gives us a clear hint that if I make L 2 large the 1 upon f noise over here is going to be suppressed and therefore, you know we can uh, reduce the uh, increase the slope and therefore, reduce the 1 upon f noise of this term. So, definitely we can try to make the L 2 over here relatively large. This also tells us that W by L 1 you know uh, we can try to keep it large so that this term is suppressed. So, I can have I can try to keep w by l 1 large, I can try to keep l 2 large. Likewise, for getting larger w by l 1 definitely I can keep w 1 large. The term over here tells us that larger g m 1 is going to suppress my white noise floor. So, this is the white noise floor if I make the g m 1 larger which is either increasing the i d 1 or increasing the w by l 1 once again. So, either I can make you know i d 1 large or I can make w by l 1 large to increase the g m 1 and hence reduce this floor further. And same thing in the second term w by n large i d large basically coming from g m 1 I can afford to increase g m 1 that is increase the w by l 1 and keep the i d slightly larger to reduce my noise floor white noise floor. So, basically by uh, following these design steps we can try to you know push this noise floor down and I can also increase the slope of the 1 upon f noise term. So, that the corner frequency is also pushed away. So, these are the favorable design steps or the directions to reduce the overall uh, white noise as well as the uh, 1 upon f noise for the system. So, far we have not considered what is the significance of this 1 upon f noise. We have just said that the signal that we are interested in processing may lie very well in this domain which can be very strongly corrupted by the 1 upon f noise. We will see that how this choice of this corner frequency is going to affect our front end amplifier design when we look at techniques to mitigate this 1 upon f noise using chopper stabilization technique little later. So, we will come back to this concept of 1 upon f noise and try to see we are trying to uh, minimize this thermal noise that is the white noise floor and also the uh, you are trying to push the corner frequency further what are the pros and cons. So, definitely you know here uh, at least we have the starting point we have some information regarding the device parameters that are in our hand and the circuit parameters that are in our hand that is the w by l of the input device the channel length of the output device and the bias current. So, these are the parameters which are affecting my noise. So, of course, again we see that there is going to be trade off right if you are increasing the i d to reduce the noise what are the two things that are going to happen. We have just seen increasing noise reduces the gain mod a v will reduce 
Likewise, increasing the ID power consumption will increase. Bandwidth may also improve, but you know, uh, bandwidth is increasing as a good point, but the disadvantage is the power consumption increases and the um, gain reduces. If you are increasing the W by L, once again, you are having the parasitic capacitances increasing and therefore, you are going to get a uh, reduction in the bandwidth. And likewise, if you are increasing the L2, once again, parasitic capacitances as well as, you know, the resulting bandwidth will be uh, negatively impacted. Likewise, if you are increasing the L2, we know that the signal swing at the output is again going to be impacted because if your L2 is increased, remember what is going to happen in the current mirror. If your L2 is increased, the required Vsg to produce the current IRF will be increased. Therefore, the Vgp will be lowered. If I am applying larger length, of course, these two transistors are supposed to be matched. So, I have to use preferably same length of M3 as well as M2. And if I am increasing the length of M2, for a given IRF, I will have lower VGP3 and that implies lower maximum allowed value of VD. So that is going to limit my swing. So once again, we are trying to show that you are trying to minimize one parameter that is noise. It can have effect on many other parameters, the gain, bandwidth, swing and so on. So, when we come towards differential amplifier, we will be reusing this analysis for our uh, uh, design of the multi-stage operational amplifier and the front-end amplifier. 